put the big boy pants on and make a shed ton of cash. All right. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I am your host, Ryan Willard. And today I am going to talk about six different ways to start making more money in your business. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Let's first have a little look at some of the issues that many architecture practices are facing at the moment. For me, one of my big intentions with this podcast, with the work that we do at Business of Architecture, is to reprioritize where the industry is facing. We do not talk about money enough in architecture. In fact, we barely talk about it at all. We've complained and moaned, and you would have heard us on the podcast many times before, talking about the complete and utter negation of the economic force that creates and drives architecture from our university education. This misgiving has profound and pertinent side effects, which we are failing right now as our fees are incredibly low and our salaries are pitiful, particularly here in the UK, which I think is, you know, comparatively to other places in the on in the world, it's, you know, I mean, I think in the architectural industry in general, it's pretty bad. Here we're suffering quite uh, quite a lot. We talk about things like our agency and our ability to be able to act. We talk about um, having the possibility of a more diverse and inclusive profession, yet one of the major identifiers or reasons why these things are difficult to impact is because we are financially impotent. Okay, as a profession, we have ignored money. We do not like to talk about money. We say bullshit like, I'm not in it for the money. I don't care about the money. That's not why I chose to be an architect. At the first day of many of our architectural education, we are met with a enthusiastic tutor or teacher who will say some nonsense along the lines of, you will never make a lot of money as an architect. This is a vocation. This is a calling. This is something that is from deep within side of you. And you will sacrifice, they don't say sacrifice, but you will sacrifice your time, your health, your relationships in order to further this noble craft of architecture. This is the message that is drummed into us from an early age on our architectural journey. And it's very, very difficult to unpick. Okay. You've heard, you might have heard the other podcast that Enoch and I did called The Cult of Design. This is the doctrine. This is the doctrine of the cult of design. It's one of these refrains that we will hear again and again and again. So the problems, we're not talking about money. That's leading us to low fees, low salaries, and lots of problems that come with it. We are an economically underperforming industry. The old guard methods of running a practice simply do not work anymore, or they are completely irrelevant. Um, the way that we assess what growth is, what success is in an architecture practice needs to be redefined for the individual practice. The profession is financially mute. We are lacking agency. We are going through this continuous feast or famine cycles in our business. Only a few businesses are actually run properly, run well. And if we look at something like the beautifully curated and compiled uh, REBA benchmark in statistics, we are continually fed saddening results as we see a dreary, miserable, underperforming industry where we look at a sole practice or a sole practitioner who's taken £25,000 home. You've got to be kidding me. Why the hell would you study for 10 years to take £25,000 home? That is why we do not have diversity in the profession. If we look at the average wage of an architect of five years, it's about 40 k Again, why would you invest your blood, sweat, and tears for these pitiful salaries that we've come to accept as the norm? There's an exodus from the profession. It's difficult to enter. It's a challenge to remain. 
there's overwhelm, stress, burnout, fear, and uh, talking about profit, talking about growth. It, when I mention these things, I'm often looked at like I'm some kind of sick creature or sick capitalist who's looking to pervert the industry into turning it into, um, you know, greedy, myopic, insane corporate uh, you know, ignorant profit led businesses. That's not at all the case. Okay. That's absolutely not the case. Profit is massively, massively important. We will talk about that in just a second. Late payments. Why is it so hard to get paid? Why are architects always the ones who are the weakest in negotiation? We are the weakest in being able to claim our fees and when we do negotiate fees that perhaps are reasonable then we have to wait six months to get them because the other consultants or developer knows that they can leverage their risk on the agreeable nature of the architect grow up architects grow the hell up low profit margins are accepted as a norm the fantastic erin uh, pellegrino she was talking recently on the one of an aia panel somewhere in the new york i think it was and she made a very pertinent point about, you know, lawyers will focus relentlessly on ensuring that they are protecting 30, 40, 50 percent profit margins in their industry. Architects, we have accepted 5, 10, 11 percent profit as being the norm. This will not do. This is why the industry is suffering This is why it is difficult to have the capacity to act. So. The other issue is we've got the cult of design. Go and check that podcast out. But I want to stand here and actually create a new possibility, a smart and agile practice, a practice that is massively prof profitable and a practice that has an incredible empowered culture around money. There is transparency from top to bottom. Okay. The business owners are happy to report about architecture, they, uh, about money. They are happy to discuss and explain the roles of their younger team members um, and how they can help making a profit and how profit will be distributed through the business and how profit is allocated and shared amongst people. There will be a healthy, transparent conversation around money, around fees, around time, around timekeeping, and ensuring that actually Good design is, you hear it all the time on the creative side of things, good design is fed by constraints. So why the bloody hell are we not constraining our design in a healthy manner, in a balanced manner with project budgets and fees? Why are we not paying attention to this? Why do we ignore it at university? So creating a business that is empowered around being able to do that and a business that is Profit with purpose centric. Okay. Uh, and actually, the whole industry I would love to see become focused on profit with purpose. I'd like to introduce the idea of growth being defined for an individual practice and success being defined for an individual practice, what that means for them. And it doesn't just mean having loads of people. All right. We've seen this in the past that the way that architects flex upon in one another is you ask them what kind of projects do you have? And they give a beautiful description of the intelligent clients that they're working with or the design art focused people that they've managed to bag as one of their um, patrons. And then they'll say some nonsense about I've got eight people in my office. I've got six people. I've got 10 people. I've got 15 people. When an architect tells me that. I panic. I worry because I'm pretty certain that you don't need that many people for doing whatever it is that you're doing. Okay. Most of the time you do not. And most architects are very good, meaning well, meaning people, then they'll make sure that they pay their team members as much as they can, which is not usually a lot, but it will usually be within the ROBA poor benchmarking standards. And then they don't pay themselves particularly well. Okay. If at all craziness. So that is not the kind of practice we want to envision here we want to envision a practice where everybody is making a very good salary well above what the reba benchmarking um, surveys are showing us and that a six-figure architect is quite the norm that is a normal thing to accomplish 
right from, you know, uh, having five, six, seven years experience, you should be looking forward to receiving a nice, healthy six figure salary for your services and for the incredible amount of time and energy and effort that you put into investing in that education. There's no need to give work away for free. I would like to see businesses becoming more diagnostic in their services, more proactive in their marketing and the way that they retrieve referrals and that they are allowing themselves to create genuine business innovations that serve the client's needs. I'd like to see businesses that are that have stable, predictable cash flow and that are charging the premium fees. Businesses that are intelligent with the way that they're looking out for certain new opportunities, they develop micro niches, multiple areas of specialization, they become deep generalists on the inside of the practice, so that's multiple expertise and project typologies internally, but they learn the art of communicating as focused experts outside, that's to their target clients. Imagine a business that is giving prized strategic advice. They are not viewed as a commodity. This is what is possible. I would like to introduce the idea of the 200 Club, businesses that can actually turn over $200,000 per full-time equivalent employee. That's about 160,000 pounds. I use $200,000 because the majority of the work that I do is with the Americans. And the Americans in general are a little bit more hungry for business and a little bit more enterprising, not always. Um, and 200 Club sounds better than the 160 Club, doesn't it really? And imagine a flexible and networked practice. Okay, so the possibility for small practice has never been like it is today. It is quite extraordinary. So I'd like to just outline actually a few ways that you can start making more money in your business. The first, very simple, very easy, simply prioritize making money, okay? Just make it a priority. This sounds almost daft with its obviousness, but making money in an architecture firm is, as I was saying earlier, it's usually just not a, it's not a priority. Um, it rarely is it tracked. Rarely is it deemed important when compared to the architectural craft. It's often very uncomfortable to talk about making profit with clients or you're not transparent with the amount of profit that you're making. Just all conversations around money are generally uncomfortable. They're ignored or avoided and there's no backbone. There's no sort of want, desire or need or kind of training around being able to have those uncomfortable financial conversations. If you really hate doing that and you are the owner of a business, then you either need to find someone who loves doing that or who is good at doing that. And there's all sorts of personality profile types that you can um, discover who are good at doing this kind of thing. Um, or you train yourself to do it. You get good at it. Okay. We've had some amazing clients here at Business of Architecture who have who, who are much more on the introverted side who have become very fierce in their collections and who have made sure that they go after money that is that is owed to them or and they've become very skilled in being able to have upfront conversations about cash as soon as the project starts okay so that's the first one just prioritize making money prioritize making profit learn to sell it okay so create it in the front part of the sell of the sale and then learn to track it, okay? There's an incredible amount of technology that's available today. Like never before, it is easier to track profit in a business like you wouldn't believe, okay? There's loads and loads of systems, loads and loads of trainings. Business of Architecture here, we do all that kind of stuff. Um, but you've got to get a handle on your profit in the business, tracking it from project to project. It is near nuts if you are not doing that. That means timesheets. I know everyone hates timesheets. There's nothing sexy about them. There's nothing interesting about them. But ultimately, they are the most effective way for you to be able to understand what is happening in your business. They give you good data for you to be able to set the rest of your fees. It's important, okay? Tell your team why it's important. Make it a game. Link up timesheets being done accurately and timely in a timely manner to your profits, okay? The profit distributions or your bonuses. 
have it as a kind of criteria um, for, for, for that kind of practice. Okay, so number one, prioritize making, um, making money. Number two, learn deep negotiation. Now, this is probably my favorite aspect of business. There's some good books here that I would recommend reading. One is um, Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. He's uh, an ex-FBI negotiator and is pretty phenomenal character. Um, his kind of language structures, the pacing, the questions that he asks and the kind of um, psychological tactics that are employed are really, really brilliant and is very well documented in the book, Never Split the Difference. So do get a copy of that. But this is in the world of number two, which is learn deep negotiation. This is the art of getting into and understanding somebody else's world very deeply. This means understanding what's motivating that person. What are their pains? What are their pains around this project? What are the emotional motivators for wanting to engage in your services? Okay. Um, this also leans into being able to have a stomach for and the comfort with having those uncomfortable conversations and having money conversations. Um, again, this ability to have uncomfortable conversations is not necessarily about getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. It's just doing it even though it's uncomfortable. Okay. And there's a, there is a, a, a certainly a sense of well being and achievement and accomplishment when you do have these difficult um, sales conversations. But as my sales mentor once said to me, you know, these are stressful conversations to have because you're dealing with the underbelly of human beings. You're dealing with emotions. So to learn to get skillful in these types of negotiation conversations is absolutely essential. I cannot explain how much value can be created in your ability to number one, to listen and listen in a very specific way where you're helping and leading a client through to discover their own pain points in their own projects um, so that you can then use that problem to position your own proposition, your own proposal, okay? And yes, we do. The, the sales conversation is not an intellectual one. It is an emotional one. Many studies, psychologists have said that in these kinds of big decisions, human beings will tend to make a decision with the majority based on their feelings, okay? And then we post-rationalize our feelings with all sorts of intellectual reasons why. So it's important that people are able and have the capacity and feel safe with you to be able to feel something in the conversation. Your skill is to lead them through feeling and to ask those probing difficult, curious questions about why a project is happening. I'll give you an example of this. Many years ago, I was um, speaking with a homeowner, a woman, um, about the reasons why she wanted to do her project. And I asked a question, something along the lines of, what's your biggest concern here with actually having this building built or why do you want to have this building built? Or what's the, what's the worst thing that could go wrong for you in this process? And she said, not getting planning permission. Now that seems on the surface of it, a very reasonable answer. And this is where it gets difficult. Okay. So the principle is easy is to listen, but we want to be able to listen under what people have just answered with. So this lady has said, um, that, the most important, the worst thing that could happen is not getting planning permission. So we want to ask why. Now, the skill of doing this in a sales conversation is that why can come across as quite an accusational question. So you might replace the word why with the word what or how and change the question of why is that and say something along the lines, ah, what is it about planning, not getting planning permission that would be problematic for you? Okay, so that's phrased in a kind of way which is a little bit safer for the person to start to explore their answer. Now, this lady was very gracious and felt kind of safe in the conversation and she said something along the lines of, well, I, it's really important for us to have our own personal stamp on this project. So I really want to make sure that we get planning permission. Ah, huh, that's interesting. How would not getting planning permission impact your ability to have your own personal stamp on it. She's like, well, I just don't want to 
you know, the planning, I don't want to have another outside organization telling us, no, we can't do something. And for us to have to make compromises, it's really important for me to feel like this space has got my identity in it. All right, we're starting to get a little bit more real here and a little bit more kind of, you know, why it's important. She wants this place to have a sense of herself in it. Okay, lots of this we could assume, okay? And, but assumptions are not very useful in the sales conversation. Well, they are, but we want the other person to tell us what they are actually feeling, okay? We don't want to make the assumption. We want them to tell us. Ah, what, do you mind me asking? This might sound like a silly question, but what is it about having your personal stamp on this that's so important? Why is it? Why are you willing to go through all the difficulty and the stresses and the challenges of doing a house renovation? Ah, oh, she said, well, at the moment, the house, the house is just like my, just like my husband's ex-wife's. Ah. The whole space shifted. The conversation shifted. There was the truth. There was the real emotional motivator for the project. Okay. When somebody's, that's a good sign when somebody's feeling that comfortable with you to share something like that. Um, and it's, it's there now for, that's part of your intel, okay? That's a very important emotional driver. And in many cases, the, the other person will appreciate having had the capacity, you haven't had the capacity to listen to them and to help them discover that. And it might be a bit of a relief for them to actually share that. Now, so important to be able to learn this art of deep negotiation. It means listening. It means uncovering things. It also means learning to hold other people accountable whilst still empowering them. Okay. So likewise, in the sales conversation, we want to be able to talk about difficult things. You want to be able to be probing and asking questions. And there's a whole structure in how to do this. We also want to be ensuring that the, the client or the press prospect understands what their responsibilities are going to be and where yours end. That needs to be discussed. Um, once we've able to find a lot of reasons, a lot of emotional pains, there's often the intellectual pains as well. We like intellectual pains to be quantified, usually quantified in terms of money and cash. If you're talking with a developer and they're struggling with um, getting approvals in certain parts of town and they've tried a few things, go into that conversation. Ask them what's been the damage that's been done as a result of not getting approvals. What were the costs of the delays? How many times did this happen that year? What was the total loss across X amount of projects that they have with these particular days, uh, delays with, with, their, um, uh, with local authorities? How much did it all add up to? How much did it add up to in a year? If this continued on for the next five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years, what kind of losses would they be looking at? Okay, so now we're starting to uncover the emotional pains, uncover the uh, intellectual pains that can be quantified. And then we're using a kind of multiplier, if you like, to be able to kind of expand the impact of this problems. Brilliant. This is negotiation because that now sets the scene and is the context for which you will be presenting your own fees. Okay. So massively, massively important. It's never about your fees. It's always about the context with which your, your fees have appeared. So the third is going to be just become an ally to your client, okay? The person with the money, not just the end user. Architects, in my experience, are very good at considering wider stakeholders, but sometimes the client, the person with the money, the one who is paying for the project, is often viewed as an obstacle to the architect's idea. This is a very outdated way and approach to be dealing with clients. I see architects all the time who deal with high net worth individuals and who don't like the wealthy. They're sickened by them. They're nauseated by them. And it's like, well, why the bloody hell are you working with them? Or is that more a reflection of your own crap around money and your own unhealthy financial beliefs and relationship to money making and profit? 
Okay, I invite you to investigate. There's a great uh, financial psychologist called Dr. Brad Kluns, um, who's written many books on money scripts. Uh, we've spoken about this here on the past in the on the podcast. Go and check that out. Go and check the, those that information out if you're interested in examining your own relationship to finance and to money. Okay, I think all of us inherit and pick up these ideas around money and we need to continually be kind of giving ourselves this mental cleansing to see where our own ideas around finance have become warped and are actually preventing us from having the kind of life that we want to have and preventing us from creating wealth and money and finance um, so that we can have agency in the things that we say are important to us examine so going back to the original point which is becoming an ally to your client we're going to become super interested in the business agendas of our clients, their financial cycles, their plans, their visions, where they're going, the market conditions that they're dealing with, um, their, their problems, their money flows, their financial flows, everything that they have or face or dealing with as an industry, you want to become very knowledgeable about. You want to be able to speak the language of your client. You've probably heard this one spoken about many, many times, but it is absolutely true and it goes a long way when you are able to demonstrate insider um, industry knowledge. Just think about how impressive it is when someone who's a non-architect starts talking to you about a Peter Zumthor chapel. You're always like, ah, this person has a modicum of taste here. Okay. So consider that if you listen to, if you listen properly and you're using deep negotiation techniques, your own architectural agendas, your sustainability agendas, your housing agendas can be effectively fulfilled if you're if you've chosen the right client to be working with and if you've negotiating well, you have more choice in the kinds of clients that you that you have, then both agendas can be fulfilled. Um, and it's a very, very fulfilling and you you are appreciated, the client appreciates you and you can be well remunerated and you can also be the first one in line to win work okay so as i said it's wonderful that we consider the wider stakeholders of a building and we must do that that's part of our civic responsibility as architects we also have a responsibility to the client and we also have a responsibility to directing the client to their own civic responsibility we can't do that unless we are an ally and our, and we have developed good skills at being able to listen and understand certainly, you know, understand the business agendas of our clients as well. Again, I come back to this idea of being fluent in finance and fluent in business, because this is why a lot of clients just um, don't allow an architect to be at the seat of the table because we're financially mute, we're financially impotent, we've got no knowledge about money, or very rarely we do. The architects that do, who can speak the language of money, they progress, okay? They're able to get into other kinds of conversations. If you don't know and can't speak about money or feel like money is alien to you, then that is something that we want to be able to address and start to learn about because it opens up lots of doors. Number four, to be, make more money in your practice, just simply spend more blooming time marketing and selling and doing high value operational work. Okay, so as a partner, as an owner in your business, there's going to be three areas that you need to be relatively skilled in. One is winning the work, one is doing the work, and one is supporting the work. Okay, and most architects are very good at doing the work, don't really think about the supporting the work. So that means the finance, the HR, um, admin, all the things that go around it, but we can get people there to help us. The other one is winning the work. Okay, that is usually ignored. And then I hear the most useless piece of advice from architects all over the world tell me this, that the best way to win work is just to do good work. <sighs> okay, that's really unhelpful. And it's basically the baseline that every business should be operating at. Okay, I'm going to do that as a given you do bloody good work. Okay, do good work. You're an architect. That's what we do. We do good work. And a lot of the time, because you, you're not marketing, you're not selling, you don't, you can't do good work because you're saying yes to crap clients. Okay, so no, doing good work is not the whole 
picture. And the reality of it is as well, is that if you're working with a client and you don't, okay, you don't make a mess, you don't make a complete balls up, then it's likely that the client won't want to go for the discomfort of trying to find another architect. Okay, so just hold on a minute. It's not, it's not like we're doing it being absolutely amazing. Okay, it's rather the, 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 the process of the client finding another architect is more painful. All right, so what this highlights too is that in a lot of businesses, the, the winning of work is totally reactive. Totally, totally reactive. If you're working in a sector that you love and you're winning more work that you and you've got great work and you're winning more of the great kind of work, then okay, you've there's a little bit of you've earned something there or you've tapped in and got lucky. But even those practices are still looking to enter into new sectors and progress and to grow. So they keep the conversation running. All right. But in general, we're very reactive as as a species of professionals and we're not spending enough time marketing and selling, learning about marketing and selling. We deeply misunderstand these two things. We think they're just add-on skills that you can learn in a weekend. They are not. They are as complex and as take the time and energy to master as the craft of architecture itself does. But you've chosen to wear the hat of a business owner. So you've got to master them. Okay. That is the that is what business is about. It's about marketing, it's about selling, and it's about the finance. All right. The techni the technical aspect of it, that's going to be for the craft people who you're playing, you're paying for. So you gotta you've got to get engaged with the high value activities in your business. There's high value activities in design, we'll talk about that another time. But the high value activities in marketing and selling, you've got to be spending at least 25% of your time doing this okay if you're doing less it's irresponsible so and if you're struggling with any of the things we've spoken about before low fees low salaries um, cash flow uh, problems you're not spending enough of your time marketing and selling okay so one day a week get off your and pick up the phone and start networking if you hate it if you hate it so much then you're going to have to find someone else to do it. You're going to have to either employ somebody, enroll someone, identify someone in who your office is, is, is good at it, but you've got to be able to do it. Okay. You've got to be able to do it. If you're, I've met many, many introverts who don't like being in public spaces or talking to people who have become quite masterful, uh, negotiators and salespeople. All right. That is just a reality of running a business. Either you've got to do it or you've got to find someone else to do it. I don't care if you like it or enjoy it, but it needs to be done because you've taken the responsibility of running a business and your career, livelihood, financial well-being, your mental well-being depends on your ability to go out and do these things. And guess what? It's actually quite fun. Okay. It's actually quite fun. And there's loads of resources and loads of people who can help you. There's loads of brilliant consultants like here at Business of Architecture. We help train um, practices in what we call the rainmaking flow, which is a process for positioning yourself, for marketing, for the copy, for your messaging, and then the fundamentals of actually conversational negotiation and how to put together um, agreements and negotiate the proposal-less proposal. Number five, create a growth plan. All right. What does growth look like for you? We often call this a vision framework and a vision framework will include core values and beliefs. It will include things like a purpose statement and a mission. Okay. A clear mission. Where are you going? What do you want the business to look like? And then another part of this is a five-year business plan, which we call a summit map, which is a one-page graphical version of a five-year business plan. Ten years is a little bit nebulous. It's very difficult to imagine that far, and so many things can change. Five years is a little bit more tangible. But having a growth plan, having a vision, writing it down, sharing it, sharing it with your team, this is really, really important. And it's okay to grow. It's okay to make a shit ton of money. It's okay to make loads and loads of cash. You can define 
what growth means for you. You can define success on your own terms. It doesn't necessarily mean having a massive practice, but it should mean creating financial targets and generating money and creating purpose and meaning around why those targets are an absolute must. Okay, an absolute must. It's so important that when you create your vision for what you want the business to look like, that you've got clear financial objectives and targets and you've got a why behind them. I can't hear any more people telling me that they're not in it for the money. I get it. I get it. I get it. Okay. But this is a very superficial um, statement that is we're using it as a safety blanket to pretend and to justify our own financial mediocrity. Okay. We're using it as a defense mechanism. It's not helpful. It's not useful. It's just living in denial. Okay. It's time for us as an industry to wake up. Wake up. Okay. I want everybody to be setting ambitious financial goals and targets and that we start to talk about them, that we start to share them. We share them with our teams. We share our, um, you know, the people in our business. This is where we want to go, that you're starting to think about your architecture practice as a mechanism for creating wealth, creating wealth for you and for the people that are working inside it and creating wealth for the people who you're engaging with and you're selling services to. The final one that I'll uh, kind of wrap up with on here is get help. Hire a coach, hire a consultant to help you do the last five things that I've spoken about. Obviously, I'm going to suggest getting in contact with us here at Business of Architecture, Enoch and myself and Nicole and our team for the last, you know, three years. And, um, you know, Enoch's been refining this for more than a decade um, I've been consulting for the best part of five, six years now, and we've brought our minds together and have created the smart practice program and the journey, the six phase journey to becoming a free architect. And we've distilled everything that we know and, and there's still more to go. Okay. But this practice, this, this pathway, we have seen create enormous benefit and profitable practices. We've seen businesses stop um, themselves from bleeding out profit to making very healthy profit margins of 20% and above. Um, we've seen businesses turn themselves around. We've seen good businesses go to flipping great businesses. And you, I mean, you, you need to actually see some of the financial reports from some of the clients that we have. I can't share those with you, unfortunately. But it's extraordinary. It's extraordinary some of the results that these people are producing. And what's often the case is that the highest performers will hire coaches and consultants and experts and outside eyes. Just think of any great sports person. They will have a team of coaches around them, nutritionists, um, you know, weight specialists, uh, performance or technique specialists, or you know, they'll be working on every aspect of their particular athletic ability with a specialist coach. Architects, we can do the same thing in our business. Architects are good at architecture. They're not often, they just haven't been trained in the world of business. So get consultants to help you. Business of Architecture, we're here. You can get in touch with, with us. Um, there'll be details in the podcast information. I interview brilliant consultants all the time on the podcast from copywriters to marketeers to finance professionals to CPAs to succession, succession planners, the whole gamut. You just go through the, the list of podcasts that we've got, you'll see there is an enormous amount of brilliant consultants who are there to help architecture practices. So that's it for now. I really hope that um, this has been of use and of value, maybe even a bit exciting and perhaps inspiring. I'd love to hear your feedback and your comments uh, about it. I love talking about this. This is what my life is about, making economic empowerment for the architecture profession a reality. I want to see us all making loads more money. I want to see more different types of people entering into the profession. I want to see the profession grow up 
put the big boy pants on and make a shed ton of cash. I've been Ryan Willard of Business of Architecture. Thank you very much. And I shall see you shortly. And that's a wrap. Oh yeah, one more thing. If you haven't already, head on over to iTunes and leave a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, the world's leading step-by-step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because you see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.